everything that we do is sha the shape of it has been changed by technology in some way. And, and I think that's not, that may not be 100% true, but it's not an overstatement. It's very, very close to being true. I think if you think about broad categories like shopping, uh, and especially in the COVID landscape, how much those things have changed, the experiences around shopping have changed. But even without that, I think if you think about how much more shopping happens as kind of an ambient experience and not a destination, not going to a store or even going to a store website, but you know, sort of having these things recommended to you or having you know these omni-channel quote unquote kind of experiences, but they're also just happening again, like through these internet of things and ambient suggestions that are just everywhere you go and you're interacting with everything around you in ways that, that yeah, have the opportunity to serve you up highly relevant content and, you know, make it very frictionless and make it feel like, boy, I didn't even have to do anything. And that's a wrap. The Weekly Wrap, ending Friday, August 21st, 2020. This week, I'm wondering, do we have the right tools in technology for marketing? And is technology serving us or are we serving technology? And when is it time we should look to new apps for our MarTech stack? So let's wrap it up, shall we? Our theme this week, of course, it's tools and tech. As David Allen, the creator of the wonderful methodology called Getting Things Done once said, when your only tool is a hammer, it's really hard to eat spaghetti. That's making me hungry. And this, well, this is the weekly wrap. Welcome to episode number 83 of the Weekly Wrap, our weekly play on words that play in the world this week. And this week, I've got a question. What's important in our content strategy? Technology, people, more of the same? Well, that's one question I've got, and we've got an answer. I'm going to talk with my wonderful friend, Kate O'Neill, who's just a wonderful thought leader in the idea of humanizing technology. And we'll talk all things content tech and technology and how they're all coming together. As always, I'm your host, Robert Rose, Chief Strategy Advisor with the Content Marketing Institute, and it's time to get this week's show underway. There's a weird thing happening in digital marketing right now. The two most common questions I get in tandem from clients and workshop attendees is how do we scale strategic content marketing and how do we measure it? There is immense pressure on the business right now to create more and more content and feed it into our digital channels. And if you peel back the layers of both questions, measurement and scale, well, they're both related to scale. In other words, taken together, there's really only one question. We need to scale our efforts, but why should we? And more importantly, why should we wanna scale something that we have no idea is working? Now, the current answer is kinda like the answer that your mom would give when you would ask as a kid, hey, why do I have to clean my room right now? Well, because I said so is why. Interestingly, businesses believe that they have to create more and more content even without the idea of measuring it. In our 2020 content management and strategy research, CMI found that half of all businesses outsource some part of their content strategy, and 84% of those who outsource it outsource the creation of more and more content. But interestingly, only 10% said that their success with content comes from their ability to extract meaningful insight from content consumption. 
So basically right now it feels like our content production of, is working. We just can't quite pin down how. And so what's the most important part of getting to that answer? More people, more technology, change, process? Well, new technology is currently the most popular answer. We believe that we're just one technology app away from finally figuring out the puzzle of how to scale and how to measure our efforts with digital content. We say things like, if we just had a damn system, or if we just bought that content performance system, or wait, wait until we get that customer data platform. I was working with a mid-sized healthcare company last month and the VP of marketing there said to me that for each and every digital content and marketing challenge that she would bring up with her CEO, she was met with a question. Isn't there a tool that can handle that? Is it any wonder that the average large enterprise now has almost 100 applications in their MarTech stack? So of course we outsource content creation. We're too busy managing new technology to spend time on creating content. 85% of marketers now say they're spending more time than ever managing technology. And we're not getting many more people either. Marketing technology now commands more of the CMO's budget than does staff. Today's digital marketer spends any of her time that's not on a Zoom call seeking out, implementing, or learning how to use some new MarTech. We have to come to an understanding that scaling our content effort is not chasing the demand for more people or adding new technology. As we've seen time and time again, it doesn't matter if you're a marketing department of one looking to double to two or adding your 101st technology application, adding scale by simply adding more doesn't work. Scaling isn't adding capacity. It's evolving everything we do to increase our value faster than we take on new costs. So our two questions, they're exactly backward. Instead of asking how we measure to justify scaling to meet our goals, we should rather ask, how do we plan to scale our goals in order to justify what we're going to measure? So now, well, now it's time for our interview segment, and we've got a truly special one this week. It's Kate O'Neill, and Kate is a strategist, a futurist. She's helping businesses and humanity, quite frankly, prepare for change at exponential scale. She's got expertise with emerging technology, big data, climate change, so much more. Kate's expertise in database business models, integrated experience strategy, and really human-centric digital transformation. It comes from more than her 20 years of experience of entrepreneurship, leading innovations across technology and marketing and operations in all of these category-defining companies. For example, she was one of the first 100 employees at Netflix, where she created the first content management role there and helped implement innovative, dynamic e-commerce practices that, quite frankly, have become industry standard these days. Kate is now the founder and CEO of KO Insights, which is a strategic consultancy committed to improving human experience at scale. I am also super proud to call Kate a really, really good friend. We had a wonderful conversation and we talked about humanizing technology and going way back to our days uh, of creating early MarTech, all the way back to the 1990s, kids. Um, I think you're really going to enjoy my conversation with the wonderful Kate O'Neill. Kate, my friend, it's been so, I, I, it's been way too long. How the heck are you? Oh, it's been way too long since I saw you in person and gave you a hug and all that yeah. stuff. Um, I'm good. I mean, I feel like it's always this big, you know, sort of, uh, there's an asterisk at the end of every answer that anybody gives about how they are in the COVID right. era, right? You say good, but then there's a little asterisk. Like, are any of us really good right now? <laughs> well, it's like this. It's like you just exchange punctuation, right? So it's good yeah. or, or good right. or good. Yeah, know? something like that. So yeah, it's like you know, it's a semicolon day, right? I mean, it's. <laughs> I prefer M dashes. That's just me. But right. uh, yeah, go go with whatever punctuation suits you. M dash day. <laughs> it's that's that's the new hashtag. It's an M dash day. <laughs> right. And you, I assume it's a very similar kind of thing on your end, right? Yes. Well, you know, I mean, it's we are here in the U.S. and you know, I mean, it's just every day seems a new match on the dumpster fire. 
Um, yeah. But yeah. I mean, you know, look, I, I, I feel a little blessed um, because, you know, it, you, you know, I'm in California, you're in New York. It's, uh-huh. it's uh, you know, it, it, it feels a little better, I guess. I, yeah. I'm, 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 I don't know. I mean, I mean, again, a question mark, <laughs> <Is> it, <laughs> but it does feel okay. If right. It just, you know, it feels like it's getting a little better, you know, I mean, at least, you know, at least we're wearing masks here. I mean, there's that. Yeah. Yeah. It's getting a little better ellipsis, I think, or something like that. It's like, there's, <laughs> there's more to the story still to come, but um, no, I mean, I think one of the nice things is it feels like uh, people are sort of figuring out a little bit more about how to adapt to remote work. And uh, you know, companies are starting to figure out a little bit more about how to engage with their customers and, and the people that do business with them in other ways online, uh, and in hybrid approaches, which is, you know, what's really interesting for me is that uh, my second to last book, Pixels in Place, you know, sort of, it talks about this blended physical and digital world. Only when I wrote it, I was thinking more about it from the other direction. I was thinking about we're all existing in physical space, but also there's digital connections all around us. And now it's almost like the inverse of that, right? We're all kind of, we're in physical space, but we're mostly connected in virtual space. And so we're trying to figure out what are the metaphors of physical space that we want to infuse that with? And what do we want to do to make it more dimensional and meaningful and integrated and all that? So it's, it's really interesting to see how you can still apply a lot of the same ideas when you flip it the other way. It's Absolutely. <laughs> it's, fa- it's fascinating. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to dig into this with you. It's going to be so much fun. So for those in the audience who may not know you as well as I do, certainly, um, tell us your story. Where did you come from? Where are you now? What are you up to these days? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so it's, it's always fun to, to decide, you know, which, which version of the story you're <laughs> going to tell since we're in a content-centric world, I think the, the version of the story that, that uh, makes the most sense is, I, I actually, so I had an undergrad and a grad education in linguistics, languages and linguistics. And coming out of that, I, I built a website that was the first department, turned out to be the, the first departmental website for the university where I worked. And that got noticed by a guy at Toshiba who recruited me eventually to come and build an intranet for them. So it got me into San Jose uh, from Chicago originally and uh, got me into Silicon Valley. So now I'm working in technology, this is the mid nineties and uh, I'm, I'm in the heart of all the technological innovation. And one thing that became very interesting was that content was what really propelled the early stages of my career because I had this, I was a writer from from many iterations back. I had actually written poems and songs and plays and, you know, all kinds of stuff when I was a kid. So I was carrying that forward. But also this perspective on language really gave me, I think, a, a very useful way of thinking about content and the way that we interact with each other online. So I had the idea of semantics and the way that we kind of conceptualize meaning and sort of packets of meaning that we deliver through what we uh, what we put online. But then syntax and sort of structure as being the, the parallel to like information architecture and all of the ways we think about links between things and, and how things should be hierarchically organized, taxonomies and so on. So there was a lot of really interesting overlap that came to be between how I thought about language and how I thought about technology. And that it turns out over the course of the next two decades in technology, it's really served me well because it keeps me grounded in thinking about what's intrinsically human about technology. And so that's more what I focus on now. My, my last few years of my career have been all about this tech humanism concept. Uh, I wrote a book called Tech Humanist. I now have a live show and podcast called The Tech Humanist Show. And I think there's a lot more to do with that concept. You know, just the, the notion of how big data and emerging technologies shape and impact our lives as humans and the future of humanity and what it's going to mean to be human in, in those spaces, in, those, in the world that's shaped by that. It's an amazing book, um, my Thank friend. And, and of course, we're going to link to it in the show notes and all of that. It's an amazing book. And I love the new show. It's, the show is fantastic. Um, and all of that. And, and it, 
it's amazing to me how many of, you know, I mean, I got my start in technology in the mid nineties as well and worked for software companies and, you know, learned how to code and do all of those things. How many of us from sort of liberal arts background, right? English majors and English lit majors and poets. And, and it's amazing to me how many of those people truly, you know, became technologists and really, you know, and, and really sort of use that content as a, as a baseline of, of, of what they're, you know, of how they approach technology. Yeah. Are you, are you an English major from way I am, back? I'm or? an English okay. lit major. Yeah. Right. Yeah. As, yeah. I, as I say, I can teach you Chaucer or marketing and marketing pays better. Right. So it's <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Well, yeah. And you know, I think it's, it's, um, it's, so important. It's a conversation that I actually just had on the last episode of my show that, you know, oftentimes I get asked, how did I end up doing the work that I'm doing? Or how do you get into this path? This was my, my uh, guest, David Ryan Polgar was talking about this, that he gets asked that question as well. And we were saying it's from anywhere, whatever your origin story is, there's a way into, you know, doing this kind of uh, technology solving for human problems. You know, you can come at that from any direction of the elephant. And, and I think it's really important that we have a lot of people coming at it from all, all directions. Yeah. It's, I mean, when, I mean, we're just on the heels here uh, at, of content tech and, and the, you know, that event. And of course that's, you know, replete with technology. And it's interesting that you say that because one of the things that has come up during the event with a few of the speakers. And certainly we've been noticing with, you know, I mean, even in this weird 2020 year that we're in and the role that technology is playing in marketing and content for sure. You know, it used to be when you and I were young. <laughs> and so, you know, <laughs> hey, we're still young. Come on. Days, right. When it was, you know, oh, it's just one line of code or it's just right. this, it's just that, you know, and, technology was so new and young and we had big bright eyes and, you know, and wide eyes. And now <laughs> it's just consumed us. It, it has, you know, consumed the marketing department. It has consumed content. It has consumed many businesses in this MarTech stack that we mm -hmm. now have to have. And we've all seen Brinker's, you know, 5,000 marketing solutions out there and all of that. And so in 2020, as we sit here in mm -hmm. lockdown in many places and in a post COVID world is, have we gotten to a place where technology just isn't serving us anymore as a business? You know, I, I think it's a really important question. And, and what I think about when you, when you sort of frame it going back to, you know, the one line of code and how innocent and, you know, uh, bright eyed and bushy tailed we all were about technology. I think about one of the reasons why I do the work that I do now is because I was such an early adopter and I was, you know, doing such a, a lot of the work that was, you know, leading edge in terms of kind of creating data driven experiences. And I feel like now we can look back and say, well, we may have been a little over eager. <laughs> we may have kind of overreached <laughs> a little too much, right? I, I did, a, um, I worked at magazines.com and I was leading the customer experience and product development team there. And uh, we had an experiment going. So we, we implemented Affirmatica, which was before oh Omniture, yeah, Omniture acquired Affirmatica and then Adobe acquired Omniture. So I was one of the uh, early users of Affirmatica and we, we had test and target, which was, you know, this kind of the platform that is now Adobe target, it's AB testing, multivariate testing. And we were really cutting edge with what we were doing. And I got trotted out when, when uh, Omniture acquired Affirmatica, they were like, you are our best customer. We're going to trot you out to all our sales conferences, client conferences, and show you to everyone and have you tell them what you're doing with this platform. And, and I was really, really excited were going about that. at that time saying, it's one line of code. Right. <laughs> I was totally doing that. But I was also saying, look, you know, you can create these personalized experiences or, you know, targeted experiences. You can look at what people are doing across the site and then serve them up relevant content. And my argument at that time was that relevance is a form of respect. You know, so I was thinking in a human centric way about it, but it was the idea that if we just serve up kind of aggregate experiences for people, 
then we're not demonstrating respect for their time and their attention and their energies to say, well, I can tell what you might be looking for. And so I'm going to get make it a little less uh, difficult for you to get there. I'm going to reduce the friction somewhat. And of course that benefits the company, you know, it benefits the brand by you know, increasing conversion or, you know, whatever tension or whatever your metric is. But of course it benefits the, the thought was it benefits the user or customer, the person too, that they get to what they need to do faster and easier and with a more delightful, hopefully experience. Uh, and that alignment is what I still say to this day is what, you know, companies should be striving for in their, their marketing and their, their experience creation is looking for the alignment between what the company exists to do and what the person outside the company exists to do and then using technology to enhance that alignment. But I think the piece that we didn't have back then that we didn't really think as much about was that as much as relevance is a form of respect, discretion is too. <laughs> <laughs> and not collecting everything that we can collect and not doing everything we can do with that data is a form of demonstrating discretion and, and you know, kind of keeping a balance of what can we do and what are we not going to do because we respect you enough not to intrude, not to create a creepy scenario, not to, you know, overreach what you entrust us with. I think all those things are really important considerations too. And then as you say, there's this kind of chasm between the, the haves and have nots when it comes to the marketing departments and the, the companies who can afford to put, you know, big enterprise scale solutions in place that collect data from across these different touch points. And, you know, they're not maybe personally identifiable, but they're able to be, you know, kind of directionally assessed and you can make some, some uh, directional claims about, well, if somebody's coming in from over there and you've seen this kind of behavior and then, then you can serve them up this kind of content and lo and behold, your conversion rate goes up and all is well in marketing land but you've just creeped out your user, <laughs> you've just overstepped. And so anyway, I think, you know, that whole area has gotten a lot more complicated. And so part of why I'm here doing what I do is to make sure that we're having informed discussions that are more nuanced now, that have more rigor, more discipline about how are we actually going to uh, benefit both sides of that equation and do it in a truly respectful way. You know, and it's, it's, it's funny because what you talk about there is really the rub of this whole thing, right? Which is for the last 20 years since we were putting in Offermatica and, yeah. you know, and vignette and, you know, and all right. of these personalization engines and, and trying to, and, you know, as I've said very often, you know, personalization, the sexiest thing that nobody does um, <laughs> yeah. because it's hard and it's, and, you know, and it means more content and all of those things. And we've tried to shorten that gap between the time that you arrive at our doorstep and the time that we satisfy your query, right? Right. And to your point, it's always been about that, you know, relevance of, mm -hmm. of, of respect. And we're shortening it and shortening it and shortening it and shortening it until the point, you know, and even Google has come out and said this, look, we want a world where there is no query, where we know before you even know you have the question that you have the question. Right. And that's where it gets creepy, right? Mm -hmm. is because if I connect those, that, th those ideas that say, I know you want to know how many cups are in an ounce or, you know, or, or, or the reverse of that and, and say now, but I know that you're baking. So I'm going to suggest a recipe and I know from your browsing history, what you're interested in. And so I'm going to serve you up something relevant. That be, it's, it's weird because that seems to be this sort of, shining star on a hill to be able Absolutely. to deliver that right. quickly and easily and relevantly, right. but it's also the creepy version of it, right? You know, yeah. it's like ask anybody if they want a personalized experience and they'll say, well, sure. And then say, well, but the, the, here's the data we need in order to deliver that. They go, oh, wait a minute. I didn't really yeah. need that. What do you think? Yeah. So that's, that's the balance I think we're having to, to grapple with now. And, and the, the truth is that I think we've just gotten to a place where predictive algorithms and analytics are so much more sophisticated than they were uh, in the early days of that discussion that those of us who've been having this discussion for a while 
kind of feel like, well, we've already debated this. We've already come to a certain conclusion. Like we know that you're not supposed to serve up too relevant a, content, a piece of content or else that feels creepy. We don't want people to feel like they're being followed, but it's not the same conversation, you know, five, 10 years later that it was then. It, it's become so much easier to, to kind of fill in the blanks and connect the dots and, and serve up truly predictive insights about people. And, and yes, yeah, so maybe it's not personalization per se, but it's able to glean from behavioral nuances and inferences what that next step would be. Like you said, if you're looking up, you know, baking references and measurement conversions, then very likely we could serve you up a recipe and you'll be like, oh, thanks. <laughs> nice. Or maybe you won't, maybe you won't be like, thanks. But I think that's the area that we get into because not only are we changing the dynamics of how personalized that content is and how relevant that content is, we've changed the interfaces too. So people are having these conversations or these inquiries and queries with more than just a traditional web browser uh, and, a, and a Google search, right? It's happening through their uh, Amazon Echo and you know Alexa and Siri and all of these different voice devices. It's happening through these kind of internet of things, on-demand integrations into their refrigerators and their dash buttons, if anybody actually uses those and, and whatever else. It, it's all of that integrated everything. It's the, the kind of mesh of all of that data across all of the devices and everything that we carry and everything that we look at and everything that we talk to. And I think that's where those of us who've been in it a while tend to lose the thread on the conversation because we didn't have those considerations a decade ago. And we have to catch up. We have to say, oh, wait, 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 that's right. It's a lot creepier <laughs> than right. it was a decade ago to be offered up something by a speaker that talks to you that says, hey, by the way, would you like this recipe? You might be like, what? What's it listening to? <laughs> what is it picking up from my environment? You've got these things happening in your home in such an intrinsic way that I think it's just a different dynamic. So yeah, it's, it's like that, um, I, I forget, I think it's Eric Schmidt from Google who said at one point that, you know, we, we have this vision of our head of the internet as a place, right? right? Where you go and search things and get things and learn things and are entertained by things. And we have to start thinking of it not as sort of, it's, more, it's much more like atmosphere, right? It's yes. just always there. Yes. It's, and, and it's and a the very different mindset for us as humans. Right. It's changing all the modalities of right. everything. Everything that we do is, sh the shape of it has been changed by technology in some way. And, and I think that's not, that may not be 100% true, but it's not an overstatement. It's very, very close to being true. I think if you think about broad categories like shopping, uh, and especially in the COVID landscape, how much those things have changed, the experiences around shopping have changed. But even without that, I think if you think about how much more shopping happens as kind of an ambient experience and not a destination, not going to a store or even going to a store website, but, you know, sort of having these things recommended to you or having, you know, these omni-channel quote unquote kind of experiences, but they're also just happening again, like through these internet of things and ambient suggestions that are just everywhere you go and you're interacting with everything around you in ways that, that yeah, have the opportunity to serve you up highly relevant content <laughs> and, you know, make it very frictionless and make it feel like, boy, I didn't even have to do anything to get that thing that I wanted. But nobody, I shouldn't say nobody, but few people actually want that once they understand the compromise that, that has to be made. And, and once we start to get a, a cleaner picture of just how much data is being collected and how much is at risk, with all that. I think the discussion changes and, and the public, I think, is starting to catch up. People are starting to understand more and I, I want them to. I think we should all want them to. We should all want everyone to be more informed about what's truly happening in the exchange of data for insight or data for, um, well, especially data for uh, monetized transactions. You know, the idea that that uh, if you were to own your data and try to monetize it yourself, it's worth about your, your Facebook data, let's say, 
it's worth about 40 or 60 cents, I think is the last number that I saw. Whereas obviously Facebook across the way that it can aggregate across so many user accounts is able to make considerably more money <laughs> on <laughs> that information. So there's a power, there's a disproportionate imbalance of power. And I think people ought to know, you know, what, what they're getting into in these, in these relationships. But it Absolutely. doesn't mean that I think marketers and content developers and experience creators and everybody can still make relevant and meaningful experiences for people. And we should strive to. I think we just need to be thinking in a, in a much more honest way about what respectful means when we do that. I love that. I absolutely love that. Well, um, you know, the work you're doing here is, is obviously super important on that. And, 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 and on that note, I mean, I could, you and I could, well, we could pour some wine and, 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 <laughs> and do this all day. Um, in the interest of time, however, um, where can people connect with you? Tell us about your new show. Tell us about where people can connect with Kate and, and yeah, online and, and elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, so, so my show is The Tech Humanist Show. And uh, the easiest way to get all the information for that is thetechhumanist.com. Uh, my company website is koinsights.com. I'm also very active on Twitter if you're there. So Kate O, K-A-T-E-O, and you'll find me being prolific all day on Twitter. So <laughs> a couple of different <laughs> ways to interact. <laughs> Very nice. Kate, my friend, thank you so much for being on the show today. I thank so you. appreciate it. Appreciate it, Robert. And that, well, that brings us to our final segment of the show, which of course is the post from CMI that I'd love for you to go take another look at, a first look at, a third, a look at, a renewed look, whatever look you're going to go look at it, go look at it. Um, and it's a wonderful post about technology, what else, for the theme of this week's show, um, written by the wonderful Marsha Reefer Johnson, a friend and family of uh, CMI. And the headline here is, What to Consider When It's Time for New Marketing Tech. Um, as I said, Marsha Reefer Johnson wrote this, but it's an interview with Peg Miller, who is another just wonderful MarTech leader. And she opens by saying, marketing automation tools, social media tools, collaboration tools. As a marketing leader, you're faced with a crushing number of technologies to choose from. Back in 2017, she referenced Scott Brinker's MarTech chart of 5,000 uh, solutions there. It's certainly almost 10,000 now. Um, and when it's time to consider this new technology, how on earth do you know what to consider? And so Peg goes through a number of criteria that you can start to use as you start thinking about selecting new MarTech solutions. And maybe, hopefully, this post will help you reduce some of that time that you're spending on the technology selection process. Great post. I want you to go check it out. And I think it'll add a lot of value to what it is you're trying to do. And well, well, that's a wrap. That's a wrap of episode number 83. I hope you're truly all well out there and taking care of each other. Wear a mask, won't you? Just wear it. Just we'll get through this a lot quicker if we would just all put on a stupid mask. Just wear one. Um, and I'm so grateful that you've taken 35 minutes out of your day to either watch the show here on YouTube or quite frankly, listen to it on your podcatcher. And I hope you're digging it. Uh, we're having a ton of fun making it. So let us know, won't you? Hashtag us up, hashtag us at Weekly Wrap. Any guests you'd love to see, any wonderful news items that you'd like us to cover, all of that is fair game. Let us know. And I really appreciate all the comments that I've gotten on social media. It's been really heartwarming for me. And if you hate the show, like you just stumbled on this on YouTube or a podcatcher or whatever, and you didn't like it, well, unsubscribe, don't watch, don't listen. In the immortal words of the band In Sync, don't want to be a fool for you, just another player in your game for two. You may hate me, but it ain't no lie. Baby, bye, 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 bye. But for now, for now, more technology, more people, what do you need? What we have to understand is that more people and new technology isn't the solution. It's the possibility for a solution. The question is, a solution to what? If our business is starting from the standpoint of, we need a marketing automation strategy, or we need an artificial intelligence strategy, or where is our personalized content strategy, we've already begun on the wrong foot. Instead, 
consider that we might set our sights on the addition of value for strategy, for better customer experiences, an audience building blog, a more efficient use of content. And let's define what that success looks like. Let's set our goals before we decide on what digital tools we need or don't need. And more importantly, what the need for more people to help address and add progress toward that value really looks like. Ultimately, people and technology are all tools of the business. And as Marshall McLuhan once said so beautifully, we shape our tools and thereafter, our tools shape us. If we want to change our shape, we should pay attention to all of the tools at our disposal equally. It's your story. Tell it well. See you next week on The Weekly Wrap. <music>